On this week's podcast, I'm talking with Jill Teal with our Reiki and Religion series, and today we're talking about the beautiful and ancient religion of Buddhism. So Jill, I'd like to welcome you to the podcast today. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to be back, I should say. Yes. <laughs> I call on you every now and again, and you're always you're always great. I appreciate your assistance when we want to learn something about Reiki. Before we get started, I just want you to know that on the farm, we've got coming up at the beginning of October, a Reiki RMA class, which is level one and two in masters. Those are licensed classes that count toward professional membership in the Reiki Membership Association. That's why we call them RMA courses. I also have Animal Reiki Levels 1 and 2 in Masters, and at the very end of the month, I have a Holy Fire 3 Karuna Reiki class. I also want to let you know about a series of six classes coming up, or six days of class coming up in December, where six days in a row on the Friday, Saturday, at the end of November, beginning of December, uh, Thursday, Friday is Level 1 and 2 Reiki. The weekend is Animal communication, I believe, and Monday, Tuesday is Animal Reiki Level 1 and 2. So if you're an animal lover, those six days in a row will get you completely up to speed with all of our Reiki and animal communication and animal Reiki classes. And I also want to call people's attention, because I know it takes a little bit more planning, to the fact that in March I will be teaching a five-day RMA class, Level 1 and 2 in Masters, as well as a level one and two Reiki class in Australia, in just outside of Canberra and Queenborough, Queenbury, in a little place called Royala at my friend's farm. And if you'd like to join us in Australia, go ahead. I'll have a link to my calendar in the notes of the podcast, and I'd love to have you check it out. Jill, what do you have coming up? What do I have? You can always go to my website, which is Reiki.com. I've got an Animal Reiki Masterclass coming up this weekend, and nice. it's hybrid, so people can join online or in person. Most of my classes are hybrid. I have a Masterclass the following weekend, then I'm off a week, and then I believe it's back to a one and a two, and then uh, an animal Reiki one and two at the end of the month, the weekend of Halloween. So that's lovely. That's the that's when actually I'm teaching the Karuna class. So we'll be nice. teaching during that Sam Hain yeah. holiday. <laughs> good energy. It will be good energy for sure. Guys, I wanted to invite Jill because we're trying to just get to know a little bit better all of the religions in the world peace grids. There are 12 religions, 12 of the world's major religions that are represented there. And of course, one of the world's major rep religions is Buddhism. And Jill is a practicing Buddhist and Buddhism and Reiki. She's also a licensed teacher, as like I am with the International Center for Reiki Training. And I thought she could help us shed a little light on it today. And so Jill, my first question for you is, did you always practice Buddhism? Or is this something that that came later in your life? Yeah, it's actually something that came later. I grew up in a Methodist family. Okay. Uh, and as a kid, I actually really loved going to church. And I loved spirituality. I liked all the ritualistic things. I didn't mind. I as I grew up, there were times where I've questioned my faith and you know, things that came up that I had talks with God about stuff we all did. And the main thing for me was I did have a hard time really understanding it, the stories and the way that it was presented. So even though I always had a tremendous amount of faith and I believed in this sort of higher power, some of the stories that were written didn't make sense to me and I didn't really understand some of these big Noah's Ark and just my brain was like, how is this possible? Which which led me to then in college wanting to look into other religions. And so I expanded and spent time in college taking religious studies and learning about different religions. Eventually then what had happened is that when I took my first Reiki 1 and 2 class a couple of years later, I ended up meeting my husband and he's Buddhist. And he didn't push it on me at all. I just happened to know that he was Buddhist and he 
grew up also Christian. I think he was Lutheran. But then as he went off to college, a bunch of his friends got into Buddhism and some of them went off and became teachers and what would be like Lama teachers. And, wow. uh, and so we had a really good in, or he had a really good in to a really good lineage. Uh, and so he started practicing this and a lot of his friends started practicing this. So I found it fascinating because by the time I had met him, he had been doing it for 20 years already. Wow. And so I was still just very open at this point and interested and one day I remember, and I had taken Reiki one and two, and I think I, at this point, I had taken the master class. I remember I was riding my bike and this was before memes and quotes and Facebook and where people would put these ideas maybe into your head. I just remember having, hearing a voice telling me wise things. And I can't remember exactly what I was hearing, but I was like, who is this? And it's, and I remember this is the Buddha in however that sounds. And I'm like, interesting, how do I know this? And it's, you've always known this. You've always had access to this information. At the time, I didn't connect it that maybe there was something going on with Reiki that had healed and was tapping into other truths that I had already known. But it made me so curious that I had said to my husband, I really think I want to go to one of one of your ceremonies because I think I'm hearing the Buddha talking to me. Right. And so that's where it began. From there, I ended up going to, I guess my first class was a really special occasion where I had the opportunity to take refuge and receive a name. And some people might be practicing Buddhism for a long time and may never have that opportunity. So the way it works is if you're lucky to live in a place where you have a, a high Lama that you can visit and go to that teaching, it'd be like similar before we had internet, you'd have to travel to William or to you, Colleen. And there are teachers who are around, but our teachers, my teachers lived in other states and actually the lineage of Buddhism that I practice has made it down to Brazil. So there is a significant branch of the Tibetan Buddhism in Brazil because our lineage was guided to get Buddhism to South America. And so I, as walking into this, I didn't realize how special this was because in all of the years that I've been practicing, I don't think they've ever had another naming or taking refuge that I know of that's come back to Minneapolis. So I was like, whoa, okay. So it was a really big, like there was, and these are all formal ways of, it would be similar to, I don't want to say joining the church, but, and not even being baptized, but like they, confirmation or something yeah, yeah, like there's these other ritualistic sort of things where you're right. going, oh, this is a really, this is a commitment. And I'm saying yes. And I'm like, Okay. Yes. I, because I, so you go up and, and it's, you're walking up in the line and the teacher is up there on, on the podium and, and blessing you and handing out cards like, oh, okay, I'm Lama Yeshi. And then you sign it. Here's the date that you took refuge. And in a way that's the beginning of it because taking refuge is saying that like, I'm committing to this and, and then having a teacher and having a name is another part of that. So. Then through that, there was an empowerment that weekend as well for Red Tara. And so then I received my first Buddhist empowerment. And that was a, a, a really special occasion. And what is an empowerment, Jill? Can you explain that to us? Yeah, it's similar to a Reiki attunement. And it's actually a ritual that awakens our capacity for primordial wisdom. And it's called an empowerment because when we receive it, we're empowered to follow a particular spirit spiritual practice and to master it and to come into its realization. So it's not actually, they can only be given by qualified Vajra masks and you have to maintain a specific practice. Similar to Reiki, you have to sort of maintain, there's a practice that we have with, and so there's various practices that I do and it's based on Bodhisattva vows. So we're doing this to help other people to end suffering. So your motivation is purely for freeing other people from suffering. And wow. so the most common description of an empowerment is that it's a transfer of power during a ceremony okay. and it's going to give 
recipients the authorization to hear, study, and practice teachings. But it's not actually, sometimes people are like, oh, giving somebody power. It's not really like that sort of a thing. It's actually an activation of ourselves that already exists within us that we just haven't recognized yet. And so you get this empowerment or initiation and then what happens during this is we ripen or mature to like our Buddha nature. And wow. so all beings possess this nature, this inner nature, without receiving this empowerment or similar like a Reiki attunement. It won't be possible to get to where it is that you need to without receiving this blessing. The blessing and the, that connection so that you're connecting with some knowledge or something that already exists, it sounds like, within you. I'm just, I want to backtrack just a little bit, Jill. When you were here, the voice that was guiding you and giving you wisdom, it almost sounds to me like maybe you were tapping into some past life information and it almost sounds like Buddha was your guide. A lot of us have angels or archangels or Jesus or Krishna or someone or Ganesha as a guide and it, it almost sounds like that. Do you feel that there's that Reiki may have awakened that in you? Absolutely. Because right. When I started reading and researching and doing the teachings and the practices, it started changing stuff in me and okay. my mind and everything became familiar to me. And it was like, I can absorb this information and retain this information. And, and it actually helped me to understand Christianity more. I meet yeah. other Buddhists who say that too. There was an awareness there that somehow I feel like in some of the teachings with Buddhism, they have answers. And so it's definitely not like a fear-based mentality religion or spiritual practice. It's more of an empowerment practice and helping people and compassion and developing wisdom and getting rid of the poisons of the mind like in the reiki precepts to getting rid of anger and, right. and so you're dissolving a lot of the same negative qualities in there and so you have these tools and so i've always looked at it as tools and in some way it helped me to understand what they were actually really saying mm -hmm. in the bible and and so i could look at the deeper meaning versus beyond a story let's say in some parts is i don't know that doesn't seem that seems a little bit well, how could that happen or, or certain things parts of it i was able to comprehend on a deeper level what they were actually saying by working with buddhism as a Isn't tool interesting yeah and and so it sounds like a couple of things. It sounds like the Buddhist teachings that you've been that you've learned been learning and that you've committed to are it's, they're much more formal than I realized. It sounds like there's certain practices and ways of doing things. And because I've long been a fan of the Dalai Lama, I read just about everything that I can read. I like to read about all religions, honestly, because I think what you said, understanding a little bit more about another religion helps me understand my own a little bit better and i think just broadens our mind and yusui sensei was a spiritual seeker he was constantly learning from other spiritual traditions as well now he grew up buddhist and was a grew up in a community and went to a tendai buddhist is it called temple is yeah. it called That's yeah did he not yeah and There's i think different because, sectors like uh, right. Christianity, you've got Baptists and Catholics and so yes. you think of like different branches and then you've got yeah. like the Buddha taught 88,000 paths to enlightenment. And so like the Cambodians have a Buddhist practice and the Tibetans, I... and then you've got the Thai, the Thai Buddhas, if you notice they're a lot like pointier. Yeah. And so there's different practices. And if you think of 88,000 different ways to achieve that, there's 88 and there's more, but it's, that's the path. And so when we think about it it's so it's not all exactly the same but a lot of the, there's a lot of the concepts the core things but then there may be different tools and techniques just like different reiki systems may have yes. different tools and techniques that's right in how they actually do the practices so there's not just one right way 
and different there's different buddhist people like that live in caves and things like i have a dear friend who's part of my practice who she's not living in a cave but she's living in a very simple and in, in taking a vow of silence for three or four years going wow. into advanced practices and things but there there were actual people who do live in caves and they will depending on the various states that you're changing and what you're healing in this life and so that meaning that different paths and techniques would be required and so i think this could be part of what inspired Asui is maybe this idea or just a thought of that there are different ways that there isn't just one way that there isn't just one way and that's actually the whole inspiration this podcast series i don't know if i will ever finish writing the book i did start it but i heard start learning about all of the different as many religions as you can because all roads lead home and uh, i know when i interviewed munakai mohammed he said it's if you lived if, if i lived in a mountain and you lived in the valley and we decided to meet at a temple or something my journey to get there wouldn't even look at all the same as your journey to get there mine would be downhill yours would be uphill i'd be coming through this terrain you'd be coming through that terrain but in the end we meet at the same place and that's the you know what i heard that that there there are all these different ways to achieve enlightenment which 88,000 ways of course and to get home and one of the things that I love, for instance, I know I love, for me personally, I love the ICRT philosophies around Reiki. They just really resonate with me. But I also love that there are so many other different lineages out there because what resonates with me might not resonate with someone else and they might need another lineage to be more appropriate to them. So it sounds like what you're describing with Buddhism is the same that and the same is with Christianity. There are so many different sects and with pretty much every religion, there are so many different sects. And rather than say my sect is the right sect and your sect is the wrong sect, I think we need to be really open to the fact that this is what works for me and that over there works better for you. And that's fantastic. And I think that's a big part of the yeah. The whole reason for this podcast, actually. Right. So. I know. I know. <laughs> I love it. Angel, just talking about this, I've seen written on the web, and of course, if it's written on the web, it must be true. Of <laughs> I say that facetiously. I see, I have seen written on the web that there are some people who say that Reiki is a Buddhist tradition. And I've always taken, and then there are other people who say, oh, if it's a Buddhist tradition, then you're Muslim, you can't practice it, or you're Christian, you can't practice it. And they kind of use, use that reasoning. And I take a little bit of exception to that because as far as I understood, Yasui Sensei was a spiritual seeker and he, we've heard that it said that he was Christian. We've heard it said that he was Buddhist. I've been, I've heard that he practiced Shintoism. Um, what I know is that he was very interested in all of them. And he does seem to have done his best to learn as much as he could about as many different religions as he was able to at the time. And so I, I realized that he was raised Buddhist, but I've always felt that Reiki was more non-denominational. And I remember asking William Rand once, is Reiki associated with any religion? And he emphatically said no, because religions can divide people and reiki is appropriate no matter what your religion and it works hand in hand with it and even if you're atheist or have no religion it still it still works hand in hand with that what is your thought around that because you have a lot more background in buddhism than i do yeah and i agree with what you're saying in in regards to buddhism and so forth again because we have so let's just say that he was buddhist right like maybe we don't know so let's just say that he was and but and he probably was there's a good well, chance that he was but the buddhist philosophy is the same as his philosophy of wanting to spread it throughout the world so there's nothing in buddhism that would say 
when I explain that Buddhism, so it was brought to the West because it was exiled and people were exiled and the, where our teachings come from, my teachings come from Tibet and Nepal. Right. My teacher was from that region, was exiled, came here with the shirt on his back and was guided to bring it to the West. And when he brought the teachings of Red Tara, so Think of where the Dharma, you've heard of the Dharma and it's a wheel and it turns. And so the Dharma and it's in the Buddhism is always the wheel that's turning. And so what's happening is that at times you have teachings up here, but then at other times as the world is changing, these teachings go down here. And this is part of these 88,000 paths that are always happening and continuously changing and evolving for what we need, just like what Reiki is doing. Right. And so my teachers have always said to me like and i think about this with reiki too is like being very careful about how you represent it and so forth because you never want to turn anybody off from receiving it and so the fact that the buddhism was brought to the west so westerners could learn it very much like how reiki was brought to the west when takata brought it and made changes the Buddhists make changes in their texts. You have sacred texts that people are doing in these teachings and rituals that go on, but as time's changing, so do the practices and so forth, because right. the wheel is always turning. So when these practices, for instance, of the ones that I'm learning, they're Tibetan practices that were rewritten by a Tibetan Nepali man, brought to the West so Westerners could learn them in a way similar to how Takata did. Now, the stories and everything are all kept authentic because that is one thing that Buddhists have is like strong integrity with their practices and they have relic holders and the process of becoming a Lama is like this process of being a tolku which means that there is like a birthright like you can't just become a llama there is a lot of work and they like looking at astrology there's different relics that the teacher before you so like when you die you would maybe have the successor who would then say okay Pam's coming back as a woman in Canada and we need to, but we don't know. We just know she could be somewhere in this region. They have the ability to see all of this stuff around this certain time. And so a lot of times they may be born in the regions of Nepal and in the Himalayas and, and, and then they send people out looking and they have all of their relics, like their mala, their bell, all these things. And then the tolku one years old is able to determine what's theirs. They're able to come into the life already knowing teachings and practices that they never learned before. And then they look at the astrology and they compare it and there's all, there's a very vigorous process. And then usually it's would be blessed by like the Dalai Lama and so forth. And so it's this birthright that they go out searching for these teachers. You have one Dalai Lama, you have one Karmapa, you have about a hundred Rinpoches, and then it goes on from there. And those people that are into that, people can make their way into teaching, but it's really through a birthright process that you come back with this information. And there are these relic hunters that can find where these sacred scripts and stuff are put away and know when to bring them back out for the right time. So wow. it's this huge thing of these things are going on and it's happening and evolving. So these teachings then were brought to the West for Westerners to be able to receive Buddhism. And then it was brought to Brazil. So it would be brought. So, the, so my, I guess my point is that in no way was it like, people aren't supposed to learn this and we're supposed to keep this for ourselves. And right. so there was an it, openness with it. There's always been an openness with Buddhism and it's so people, because the whole thing is to free yourself from suffering and it's to remove from attachment. So you mm -hmm. have no attachment to something and you're, and you're healing your ego and you're doing all of these things of not like, this is my religion and only you can do it. And, and if there's respectful ways of practicing and of course traditions and things that, that would go into any sort of thing. But it's in my opinion that if he was born at least a Buddhist person and growing up in that way and study different religions, that, that common 
like part of him that wanted to spread Reiki throughout the world comes from that Bodhisattva intention of wanting to help other people, which yeah. in my mind is a Buddhist philosophy, but you don't have to be Buddhist to have that sort of heart and want to help people. And so I think that even if he was or if he wasn't, we don't have to have a label because once he obtained that state, you on the mountain where he achieved peace he had moved beyond all of those barriers the the anshanditsume or the perfect mm -hmm. peace the that's right and so yeah. i think he got point he moved beyond that mind frame of that separation but he used buddhism as a foundation and a spiritual practice as ways of helping to achieve that sort of that state that buddha nature that he was wanting to achieve but oh, he didn't that's... need to be like i'm buddhist and there's people who could be buddhist but not practicing buddhism that's right <laughs> and and a label a la well and but now tell us a little bit about say your daily practices with buddhism because as you've described them i've realized that they're a bit more formal than i thought they were i know you we've been together in buddhist temples and you've explained some of the teachings and some of the prayers and the wheels and whatnot but what would be a tip what would be some typical practices for you as a practice and how long have you been practicing buddhism yeah for a long time <laughs> for a really long time i want to say oh, geez i hate I, it's hard putting dates on things anymore but um almost 20 years wow so it's, and you've had a while so it's a while looking at exact dates or whatever if you start to go wait <laughs> I don't want, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I got to do math now. No, no, no I'm not asking yeah. you to do math this no, evening. <laughs> it's been a long time. It's been a long time though. And so I've been practicing it for a while. And in Tibetan Buddhism or in the lineage that I practice, you usually you start with a preliminary practice. So a preliminary practice is something like Red Tara. That's a practice that I do. This is a picture of the text, if you can see this. For those who are watching on YouTube, you can probably yes. see it. But then for yes. those who are listening, yeah. And so then in that, you have an opening prayer that you do. And then you go into dissolving the space around you. And then through this, we practice what's called guru yoga. So then you can embody through the empowerment. It allows you to take form, merge with the, the so Tara. So red Tara is one of my practices. So then you're merging with and going into Tara primordial wisdom and and then you're asking basically for your obstacles to be removed so you can obtain your aspirations and help other people then we do an offering and in an offering a lot of times you're doing you're doing gestures with that and there's different ones for different practices as you're offering and then you're basically dedicating the practice and offering prayers of aspiration and dedicating it to other people so there's a way that you do that and to get through it, I mean, it, like a self Reiki practice, how would I compare that? You could do as little or as much as you want to. And to really get through it, probably if you're really doing it and you're really in it, it's an hour. It's probably, it's an hour because when you have the mala, the, the bead of the malas, and yeah. so the mala is to count your prayers. And so when you're doing your prayers, you're, you're doing your mala. And so you have to do... Uh, for Red Tara, it's a hundred thousand jetsoons. And so if you do so many per day times this, it comes out to a couple of years. It takes you to do, right, to do that um, many prayers, do the recita recitation of that. And so as you're re reciting this, what's happening is it's rewiring your brain because what you're doing is instead of going, oh, I'm so unhappy, blah, blah, blah. You're like, now you're bringing your brain into rewiring. And so that's changing things. And so this changes your mind because you're literally changing what you're saying to yourself. Wow. And so it becomes very powerful. After you complete the preliminary practice, then you can move into Nundro. And Nundro takes, if you're doing it active, that's another set of practices. 
And that takes about three, three years, three months, three days really? to, to complete that. And within the Nundro, you've got four different areas that you're dissolving. And so you're doing offerings. You're also doing guru yoga. You're doing prostrations, which is a really vigorous process that you may have seen before where you see Buddhists bring their hands up and then they go onto the ground and then they come yes. back up. Those are prostrations. And you'll see like in Tibet where they'll walk for hundreds or thousands of miles doing that. And that's a way of purifying your body karma because it, it tones all of the meridians and the channels. And what's happening when you're doing that is while you're in pain going, I don't want to be doing this is the exact reason why you're doing it. It's just, it's this agonizing and it sounds horrible, but at the same time, it's this offer of I would compare it to Jesus where they're giving the gifts and things like this and so forth it becomes this it's like this offering it's like the highest offering almost in a way that you can be giving are and you have to do a hundred thousand of those and this is a lot more involved than I realized it's, yeah it's pretty involved and then you're contemplating in permanence which because one of humans main human suffering is fear of death and in and it doesn't like make it easier but what it does is it helps us to work with one of the main reasons why humans suffer people suffer and so as you're going through this process what happens is that over this time these feelings they start to dissolve and it changes you you can, and then from there then you're ready to move into zogchen teachings and zogchen teachings is really what the Dalai Lama is teaching. And interestingly enough, they aren't these hard things. It's everything that we know, but all of a sudden it's, I got it. <laughs> and you when you know it on a different point, level, do you, or? On a different level, because what I'll say is that in like Reiki, we repeat ourselves a lot. <laughs> we say the same things over and over again. In Buddhism, it's very much the same way. I go to these teachings, I hear different things each time, but when I hear the Dalai Lama or I hear teachers, they're always talking and it's like about the same stuff because that's what it's about. And it's, oh great, I wanna to get to the deep stuff. And it's, that is the deep stuff, this is it. But somehow over time, it just, it's different. And maybe it's comparing taking a Reiki one class to getting to animal Reiki and you're going, wow, my life is different. Yeah. It, it's a change yeah. like that. It's a, it's a measurable change where you're going, whoa, something different is going on here. And, and so because of that, and because of the motivation of helping other people, developing more compassion, I don't see it as being a religion. I see it as being like a tool that has helped me to be a better person, to be a better teacher, and somewhat to understand Eastern teachings. There's times where some of the practices and people are like, why do they say that in Reiki? And it's through the Buddhist practice that things make sense. Oh, in Buddhist, and a lot of times I do refer to various and I'll say hey I don't mean to talk about it but this but I know this and this is what I would say that this would mean because it correlates it with language or various things that might sound off like maybe like how the Reiki precepts are like just for today do not be angry and some people are like why would I say just for today why wouldn't I do it every day and it's because the Eastern concept is being in the moment and being present and and not being in the past and and so if we move away from our western philosophy on kind of the idealism way of everything could always be better you can understand the eastern concepts and that sometimes helps people in classes to understand why some of the things maybe are written the way that i know a lot of people jill like this is fascinating i think i could just talk with you about this all day because i think a, a lot of people i talk to a lot of people who say i'm very drawn to buddhism and just drawn to the generosity the peacefulness the meditative aspects and this sort of thing and certainly i'm a, a huge dalai lama fan I just i devour every book that he writes and every, it's 
just fascinating philosophies. And how do you find, I, I didn't realize you were so deeply into the practice. I knew you were Buddhist, I knew, but I guess I didn't realize what the practice entailed. Do you have a temple or a church or is this all pretty much mostly self-directed? In Minneapolis, we have a group that meets up. With COVID, things have changed and we do some stuff online. The, our, my main teacher, she actually runs the center in Brazil. Okay. Uh, there's another center, Riggs and Ling, which is near San Francisco. And Chagud, Chagud Gongpa is the foundation that has a lot of different places around the country. Yeah. And so specifically in Minneapolis, we have a group, a Dharma group, and my husband, one of his best friend, and then his wife, the one who's on the spiritual retreat, because she's moving into higher levels of her training because she's gone on to the silent retreat. And so yes. she may be staying out in San Francisco and working at Riggs and Ling. And then the husband is here and doing his thing. So that's an interesting, hey, I'm going off and going to be gone for three years. And so there's... <laughs> I'm Buddhist, what do I do? And things like that happen. We have a group and they have, because of their connection and how long they've been doing it, they can run our group. But they're not in any way teachers or people that can transmit the teachings. They can, though we can all practice together. And then they bring teachers in for us to receive the empowerments and various teachings that we need. That's lovely. Um, so they're more like facilitators, it seems. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. And how does this all go together with Reiki for you? How does that blend work? It feels like it blends really naturally to me. I do still see myself as being very open spiritually. So other guides come in, other people's guides come in. I work with other guides other than Buddhist guides, but I do have, I do have that. And again, it's like my core sort of spiritual practice. But a few years ago when Holy Fire came through, I want to say when the Holy Fire 3 came in, I was shown a technique that I could do in my red Tara practice and then actually charge my Reiki grids as I merge and become Tara. And, um, and so I've been shown some techniques. I know other Dharma friends of mine that have taken classes that have also said that. I find that the language is really beautiful. There's a lot of similarities there and things that it's very easy and natural for me to talk about it because that sort of that truth is there. William's done a great job at a lot of the research that he's done over the years. And so there's a lot of things that just resonate. And I love it when when people from other religions like are coming in and other Buddhists are going, hey, this is like da 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 da, or this is or And it's yes. And so it's really beautiful. I love how Reiki surprises people too. Like one of my friends grew up in a Lutheran and his father was a pastor and and he had said his whole life he never really had spiritual experience. He's a Tibetan Buddhist and he never really has had. And Buddhism is like cutting through that. Like those sort of mystical experiences are chatter. It's like, hey, can you do that without that? So it's not, they really want you to dissolve all the outside and the inside. And so the duality is a huge part of it. And he would be talking about, well, I'm in the bamboo forest and it's the perfect thing. And you're like, I got nothing. And then he's, and then I come to Reiki class and Archangel Michael shows up and then he's like, what? And he, we laugh and it's of course. And so I love to see the expansion of even moving beyond and just like being, I don't feel limited. And I've had good talks with one of my teachers, Lama Searing, and I've been blessed that some of my teachers are women through the lineage that's been, and that's something I've heard before where people have said women can't hold positions of power in Buddhism and in, in some sects possibly, but in the Tibetan lineage that I'm in, there's actually a lot of women. We've also heard the Dalai Lama talk about that women may, he may be coming back as a woman. So that <laughs> women are celebrated and maybe in some sects they aren't, but I I just want to know that women are empowered in the Tibetan Buddhism lineage that I'm in. And there's several women and several women teachers. And so one of my dear teachers, Lama Searing Everest, she 
she had told me how I can work with Reiki and I had an astrology reading with her years ago before I even knew the potential and she pulled some friends aside and was like, who is that girl? If I'm going to have a healer, I want it to be her. And I'm like, what? And I was like, she's not talking about me. This was, I was really like early on and insecure. Some of the stuff that comes along with the Reiki and you're like, wow, the changes that we tell yeah. people can happen. And I was blown away that it was within my astrology chart. And, and just, so she guided me and had told me early on. And so I felt blessings from the very beginning that it was okay. And that I was empowered and backed by the people that were working with me spiritually. And I felt like I had some really solid teachers that, that couldn't be there. They couldn't be disproven, whatever they very high integrity, solid foundation with great practices. And, and it's always been that way. So I, I feel very lucky that it just seems like it's all meant to be. And it's coming back, like you said, in the beginning from something that was like in a past life for me. Yeah, and because I think in Buddhism, certainly in most religions, actually, and even in early Christianity, before it was changed about 400 AD, I understand that most religions have a belief in reincarnation. I didn't realize astrology was part of some of the Buddhist traditions. Are you? It sounded like you said it is, it is or it can be. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yep, and, one of, and my teacher, Lama Siring, is a is an astrologer so she does charts and she's a really good astrologer and they use it as a way and my teacher before Chagud Rinpoche he was a Tibetan medicine healer he was astrologer he was a physician like he had the power to heal he had the power to call in storms if he if they needed rain he was a powerful person and not like I'm powerful, but just had the ability to work with energy. And so through that also comes, there's healing modalities connected to this practice that I do. Wow, it's energy all the way through. So Buddhism yeah. really is, it recognizes. And I have a lot of friends who are astrologers and I do follow some of that. And then even like the human design, like a lot of it goes by astrology and it always astounds me how accurate it is whether you believe in it or not when you do look at your birth chart and you look at the different aspects of how you probably show up in the world it yeah. always is amazing how accurate it is jill what would you tell any of our listeners who might want to learn more about buddhism where would be a good place for them to begin if this was something that they've been curious about or would like to learn about Sure. Turgar is a great, you could look that up online. They have online campuses and also local. They're a really open network. A lot of different Tibetan practices may come together there. And so people may, if they're looking for something, it might be a great way. Because what I find is that some people could get a little bit like, woo, that's a little over my head. You walk into a thing and people are doing Tibetan, you're like, whoa. And, and so I was lucky enough, like in Minneapolis, that I knew the folks that were running it and they're like my best friends and so we can just be talking and I'm like hey what do I do on that again and because you, you, it's not like anybody's gonna go you did that wrong but <laughs> if you're like what are you even doing you got to get caught up yeah. and, and so Turgar is a really great community with amazing teacher that has preliminary practice and other information that people sort of basics and things that I don't think that I got when I joined no, it sounded like you jumped right in with both feet jumped in. Yeah. <laughs> and it was hard and it was like and I was nervous oh what do I do where do I put the teachings and it's fine and some folks might go that's for me and Riggs and Ling is in San Francisco and they hold retreats and and so you could look into that there's a lot of different types of Buddhism and so Sometimes what happens if people don't resonate with a certain teacher, it could turn them off completely. Right. So they might be like, oh, I really want to get into Zen because they hear about Zen. And then they go and take Zen and they're like, oh, maybe I don't want to do Zen because <laughs> it's like there's a lot of chanting and there's a lot of sitting and, and that's boring. And, and it, just being honest, you know, I've got some wonderful teachers that's we're done. We're supposed to be done at 630 and you're going until 1130 p.m. And you're like, oh, my I have God, a teacher like that. I got to go. <laughs> But it's, I think it's important to find, it's really important to find a good teacher. 
Yeah. And so don't be turned off if you have an experience and maybe it's not the right one. Maybe that's just not the right lineage for you. And so don't say, oh, I don't want to do this because of that. And it just might be anything else. You're going to have good and bad teachers through your life. And, and so that's a barrier that I see if people are to talk to me about Buddhism. One of the things is, oh, I was interested in Zen Buddhism. I was interested in this and I didn't really get it. Or, and so then they're like, so I didn't go back. And so look, keep looking, find a different teacher. There's many different lineages. It's not all exactly the same. Just like going to the Christian churches, they're not all exactly the same. Everything is different. And so you just have to find the right teacher. And now teachers teach online. You would have access to Riggs and Ling and because they do things online and teachers are teaching online. You don't have to always travel, which is a really neat thing because it means that you can be wherever you are and have access to that. So the Riggs and Ling would be where some of my teachers, Lama Padma is, and as I mentioned, Lama Searing, she's in, in Brazil. Lama Kadra, I think she's in New York. And people, they move around and, and stay in different places and stuff. And then they might be traveling through your area. So you could also see, and you could look on the website because there's different practice groups. So like for instance, in Minneapolis, we don't have like a teacher living here, except for we do have Turgar. So we have Mingur Rinpoche is here and he's, he's not, he moves because there's different parts of Turgar, but, but specifically the group that I'm part of is the practice group and people can come. The thing with Tibetan Buddhism is though, is that you need to receive the empowerments. And so the empowerments, it's to do the practice. And so that's where you need if you really want to do this, then you need to go get the empowerment. Right. So you're empowered to do it and then find your practice group or start with something, like I said, look into Turgar and see a little bit different way that it's set up might be a good option for you as well. I love that. Thank you, Jill. My gosh, you've given us a lot to think about. And I asked Jill if she would lead us in a prayer or a meditation at the end of our session, just so that we can all have an experience with this. Jill, I'm just was there anything before we move into that that you'd like to leave people with? No. So what I'm going to do is just call the seven line prayer. I will say it first in the translation and then I'll do it in Tibetan. I'll do it in Tibetan three times just so you can hear the flow. So this is an opening prayer. And so it would start with on the northwest border of the country of origin in the pollen heart of the lotus, you attain marvelous, most excellent city. Renowned as the lotus born, you are surrounded by a circle of many sky dancers. As I practice following in your footsteps, I pray that you approach to confer your blessings. Guru Padma City Hum. Orjin Yu Jin Yu Jam Zam Pe Ma Ge So Dong Po La Yat San Sho Shi Nu Jub Ne Pe Ma Jun Ne Je Ju Jog Kor Du Kadro Ma Kor Ken Ki Je Su Jog Ju Ji Jin Ji Lab Je Je Ju So Guru Pe Ma City Hung or jin yu jin nu drop zam pe ma ge so drop pola yat san sho jin nu drub ne pe ma jun ne je zu drog kodu kadro mam po ko ken ki je zu drog ju ji jin ji lab je se ju so guru pe ma city hung or jin yu jin nu drop zam pe ma ge so drong po la ya san sho ji nu jub ne pe ma jun ne je su drog ko du kad ro ma po po ken ki je su drog ju ji jin ji lab ji ze ju zo guru pe ma si di hung all right. Wow. How did it feel? Like it changes something inside you. Like it changes you. It's, uh, I felt that way in one of my earlier podcasts, Glenda Labillawa went through 
the Thanksgiving address with us first in English and then in in Mi'kmaq in and and I could feel something inside me changing and it felt like that nice. it felt very similar and even when you were reading it in English I was just I could feel the shifting yeah it's powerful I, I really is it's like Reiki it's just you bring your hands together and just it's a tool and it, and it, it shifts an energy doesn't it it does yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jill, I can't thank you enough for giving us this insight and this peek into what Buddhism is about. And it's funny, I've done a fair bit of reading around it, but you've brought a lot more out than I realized was part of the practice. I really appreciate you spending the time with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's been wonderful. And I'm so happy to share this information. And I hope that some people are inspired by it and look into it if it if they feel called to it. I thank you so much. And I thank you, the listeners. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate you. I'll have Jill's contact information in the write up. And so if any of you feel a need or would like to reach out to her, please go ahead. Have a beautiful week, everyone. Namaste.